know, growing up in a small town, there there weren't a whole lot of things to do. The nearest movie theater was about 25 miles away, and it was usually like the dollar theater. They didn't charge a dollar, but all the movies were a little bit outdated. They were the ones from last season because they just didn't get the newest movies in town. And you could drive 40 miles and go to a little bigger town and, and see newer movies, but they really had to pay for that and fight the traffic at the mall and all that kind of stuff. So most of us just found ways to keep ourselves occupied in our small town, and we would do, well, pretty obnoxious stuff. My mom had a big, giant GMC van that had the, the fold-out bed in the back and the four captain's chairs and sink and refrigerator the whole night. It was like a small Winnebago. But I figured out how to do donuts with it and how to climb the side of the hill at the auction barn with it and how to put 20 or 30 people in it and cruise up down the road in it. We would stay out till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on a school night and worse on weekends. Sometimes we go to sleep at all. But there really wasn't anything to do, so we were pretty much making up problems. I remember one of those problems, one of those things that we did to, to kill time was a game called tag, a vehicular tag. We had a grease rag and we would tie a knot in the end of it. And back in the day, everybody's door handles pulled out. And so there was a, a it was either a push button with a big handle or it was that door handle that pulled out. And we would tie the knot in the grease rag at one end and drop it through the door handle. And whoever had that would drive around town until somebody else playing the game saw it. And then whoever was playing the game would corner them and take the rag and they would be it. And then they would run and the only the only rule was you couldn't hide your vehicle while you had the rag. You couldn't park it in a garage or hide it in an alley and leave it there or anything like that. You had to be on the move in normal areas, constantly moving so that people could find you. Now, this was way before the days of cell phones, so there was no coordination uh, of, of hunting people down. It was you saw them or you didn't. And if you saw them and you saw they had the rag, we would have guys that, you know, because we had the van, we would have five or six guys with us. And if we saw the person with the rag, we might corner them in an alley and, and chase them to a place where they had to make a specific turn. And then we would have an ambush of guys waiting for them to drive by who would jump out and take their rag. We even had one guy who was really tall who could hang out the window and snatch the rag at a stoplight. So we had, we had plenty of things to do that we just made up, but none of them were good or wise. And Many of them probably were really close to breaking the law. We did do a little street racing out by the airport. We did do some burnouts and some donuts. When I had the Chevy Impala, we used to do a lot of that. In fact, it became so recognized that I got a ticket, well, a threat for a ticket, while my car was in the driveway and I was in the house. And what Officer McNally said to me was, um, I heard your car turn XYZ intersection, and I know it was your car because nothing else sounds like that, and I just didn't catch you before you got home. You were driving that fast, and I was like, no, I wasn't really driving that fast. He said, well, I, I heard you squeal the tires, and I said, I may have squealed the tires on accident. He said, why? I said, well, my foot slipped off the clutch. I just left the pool, and my feet were wet, and he said, oh, so you're driving barefooted because that's against the law. It, it was that kind of town. Let me contrast that with a news report that I saw last night. Um, a crowd of young people, I, I don't know how big, and I, I don't know how young, the two that were clearly identifiable on the video probably looked to be 18 or 19 years old. Others that were not identifiable, I would say a sizable crowd, probably in the 200 range, were gathered around as one guy in a what looked like a retired police car, Crown Victoria, did donuts in a grocery store parking lot. And apparently it's not the only time that they've done this with hundreds of people watching and hundreds of people gathered around. They'll do it at that store and they'll do it at another store and there are several other places. And if you watched the local Dallas news last night, you probably saw this report. But what really caught my attention was two things. Number one, while this car is doing donuts, there's an 18 or 19 year old man with a pistol in his hand, looking right into the camera, firing blindly into the air, multiple shots, just shooting 
rounds into the air. And I don't know if he remembers high school science, but those bullets have to come down somewhere. And when they do, they can kill somebody. The sadder part of the whole thing was that when they asked, you know, why does this go on? Someone said, and this was a law enforcement officer, he said, well, they know the police aren't going to come because they're rabble rousing. They're loitering in the parking lot of this grocery store, running off all their customers, two or three hundred people hanging out uh, as a car show, doing donuts and showing off the power of their car. And even the firing of guns into the public, into the air at random, is considered a low priority call. So they know the police are not coming. The police won't respond to an incident like that because they're already so overwhelmed with the rapes and the break-ins. And so if you're being assaulted, if you're being raped, if you're being burglarized, that's what the cops have prioritized to respond to. So the police are not coming. They're not coming anytime soon for, for donuts and rabble rousing. And because of that, it basically says this lawlessness can continue however it wants to. And, and I'm not sure if the idea of reporting on it was about increasing the opportunity because, I mean, frankly, if you tell a bunch of 20-year-olds with guns and fast cars that the police aren't going to respond to them because they're low priority, I don't think you're curbing that behavior. I think you're inviting it. I think you're causing more people who might be interested in that type of entertainment to get out there and be entertained that way. But they're not going to get caught, right? I mean, the, our whole justice system was designed, I'm not saying it works this way now, but it was designed to be a frightful deterrent to ridiculous behavior. It was supposed to be such that if you violate the law, you were so miserable because of the outcome, because of the consequences, because of what would happen to you for violating the law, that you didn't want to do that again. And you didn't want to get caught like so-and-so got caught because you don't want that fate. But if that fate is, behave how you want to. We're going to tell the police, this is a low priority call, or you know what, just stand down altogether, let whatever happens happen. I don't think those types of responses, any more than a parent who says, I'm counting to three, 34, 35, 36, deters a child from behaving in a non-compliant, potentially hazardous or harmful and certainly destructive manner. I mean, I wouldn't want to go grocery shopping in a grocery store where there's lawlessness in the parking lot. One excuse the police department had was, well, it's private property, so there's really nothing we can do about it. Really, because if I were beating my dog in my front yard on private property, someone would call the police and I would be arrested. I'm quite confident of that. So how is it that this type of behavior is tolerated, accepted, considered a low priority call, not even worth the bother? You know, a lot of people misunderstand a, a verse in Scripture. And I'm going to quote the verse for you. I can't remember the address right off the top of my head. You probably know it. Uh, in fact, if you've heard it before, you've probably heard it taught wrong. The verse says, For a lack of vision, my people perish. Or for a lack of knowledge, my people perish. In another place, but for a lack of vision, my people perish. It's in Proverbs, I believe it's in the... 18 or 19th chapter. And many people think that means that I haven't prepared a vision for my life. I don't have a plan. I don't know what part one will be or 1A or 1A1. I, I don't know what the steps are to make my life successful. And so I'm just going to flounder. Okay, that is not what that verse says. In fact, if you dig deep enough into what it means by vision, the the translated word there from the original language means if they don't understand that there is a high price to pay for lawlessness, 
then they will perish. And perish means they will run around overwhelmed with their own behavior. And they'll do whatever seems right to them without regard for the law. And if you dig into that deep enough, you'll find that the behavior they were talking about was total anarchy. So here's what it really means. For those people that don't understand that your lawless behavior leads to eternal damnation, there is a point where your lawless behavior leads to eternal damnation. If you don't see that there's a giant price to be paid, then you will march blindly off the cliff into the giant price that is to be paid. If you cannot understand that behaving this way and not changing your behavior has significant consequences, then you will suffer those very significant consequences. That's what that verse says. For a lack of vision, my people perish. They will destroy themselves. The description of destroy themselves is a type of anarchy that looks like slam dancing with knives in their hands. In the description, they jump around cutting themselves and beating themselves. They're self-destructive. They have no respect for each other and no respect for themselves. Kind of like firing a gun blindly into the air, with no idea where the projectile is going to go or when it will come down or where. That's pretty self-destructive. But it happens because their lawlessness is allowed to continue. Now, this particular event was in a part of Dallas that is pretty well known to be an African-American community. I'm not making this about race. But I have to wonder, in the same way that there are now places in the United States and all over Europe that are considered, quote-unquote, no-go zones. I know there are some in Chicago. I know there are some in Detroit. I know there are some in Europe that are uh, dominated by a different kind of law where the law of the land has been usurped or replaced because it's not worth the price necessary to enforce the given laws of the land because it will cost you more personally. The police officers in certain places in Europe, media in certain places in Europe, are simply not allowed to go. They are told by the ruling community, you will be beaten, you will be assaulted, you will regret having shown up here. Deliver a pizza, show up in a law enforcement uniform, bring a camera, and you will pay a high price because our law doesn't tolerate you being here, even though we're on your land, in your community, in your city, in your state. And that nature of lawlessness, that this is our community, this is our culture, this is the way we choose to behave, um, it's a common thing. It's all over the globe, and it has been for all time, for all human history. The first murder, when the murderer was called to account, he said, what am I, my brother's keeper? Why should I even be concerned about his welfare? Why do I even care about him? It was the epitome of selfishness. The epitome of, I'm going to live my life my way, and I don't care what anybody thinks about it. And I have to wonder if the media treatment of the conversation, i.e. Charlottesville, and as far back as Ferguson and Michael Brown and every major disruptive incident since then, regardless of the reason for the disruption, by the way, I'm not saying anything about how and why the disruption started. I'm just saying that everything the media has covered that has been a major civil disruption in the last five or seven years, the media has been able to make that look like we have giant race wars raging across our country. Now, I'm not saying we don't have racial problems. I think we do. I think we have a division among humans that doesn't belong there but it's been instigated by a greater force and um, it needs to come to an end. It really does. I don't know if you've read this book, Under Our Skin. I thought there were some fascinating 
things in here, and I haven't even finished reading it, but I want to share this couple of paragraphs with you. He says, I think young children, this is uh, from Benjamin Watson. Uh, Benjamin Watson is uh, a tight end for the Baltimore Ravens, and uh, I believe he held that position when they played in the Super Bowl. But when things first uh, tipped off in Ferguson, he wrote a long blog about what it means to be African-American and had some very insightful things to say, uh, the result of which was uh, more than 10 million views and shares on that blog. It's been all over social media. His comments have been everywhere. And so he finally put it all in a book and made it available for everyone. I saw him on a television interview not too long ago. I had a chance to sit in the studio and listen to the interview. And, and um, he's a very bright young man with uh, a bright future in front of him. Uh, page 33, he says, I think young children grow up with an awareness of race, but also an acceptance of race. When they're young, when we're young, our playmates are to us simply blonde or tall or female or noisy or brown or peach skin. Race is a neutral part of how we understand the world as children. But as we grow older, we begin to learn from those around us, our parents, our friends, our friends' parents, and we pick up their attitudes about race. Now, if you've watched this program for 10 minutes or 10 days, you know that one of the key issues in my life in teaching leadership is attitude. How you think about what you feel and how you feel about what you think, that's your attitude. Now, both what you choose to think and what you choose to feel are completely within your realm. If you have been manipulated in your attitude to think a certain way, to feel a certain way about a certain thing, you have been suckered. The way you think is your choice, your fault, your responsibility, and your power. The way you feel is your choice, your fault, your responsibility, and your power. And if you surrender those, you're going to be a victim the rest of your life. Attitude is a big, big deal. I like the way he says that. As we get older, we begin to learn from those around us, our parents, our friends, our friends' parents, and we pick up their attitudes about race. Attitude is extremely contagious, more than the common cold. Brown and peach become black and white. We each view every event in life through a specific set of lenses. The lenses are crafted from birth, initially affected by our families of origin, and subsequently molded by various encounters with the people, paradigms, problems, and places we encounter in life. Race economics and religion contribute hugely to shape our worldview. They also blind us into a group identity, and we tend to adopt the attitudes and prejudices of the group we're in. On page 41, he says, Black people and white people see the world through completely different lenses. The racial divide is about the reality each side sees. Each side believes its view is the true reality, and we can't understand why the other side doesn't see the same thing and understand our reality. Let me interject there. We've talked several times on this program as well about if you saw a car accident in an intersection and there were five witnesses, you would have six different viewpoints of what happened in that car accident. Five witnesses, six viewpoints. We all have a way of seeing the world a little bit differently because of our own past, because of our own pain, because of our own relationships, because of our own encounters, because of our own personal experiences, we see the world our way. What is true is really, really hard to discern. I believe in absolute truth. I believe absolute truth comes from God's word and that the things that we say and do based on our experiences in life, our encounters in life, are a lot less true than what God has to say about them. Chris later said we talked so much about his side of things that he wanted to hear mine. I wrote down a few thoughts and sent them to him. Now understand this is Benjamin Watson explaining reality or truth from his point of view. He says, quote, I take our side because I remember someone threatening to call my sister, quote, an N-word you won't like, back when we were in grade school. Quote, I take our side because of the, sh the stares, the shadowing, the hollow may I help yous, 
that my wife receives when she shops at a high-end store in an area that she's apparently not supposed to be in. Quote, I take our side because whenever I watch news coverage of black people breaking the law, they're called, quote, fatherless thugs. But when a white boy kills nine people at a Bible study, he's said to have mental problems. Quote, I confess to have a natural tendency to give people who look like me the benefit of the doubt, especially when it comes to deadly encounters with law enforcement. I just do. And then I yell at the TV too. I am thoroughly convinced that we have a large problem in our country and around the world. Racism is not an American uniqueness. Uh, slavery, I don't care what you've been told, slavery is not an American uniqueness. There are slaves today. America is the only country that fought itself to death to end slavery. Not everybody was on the right side of that decision. Not everybody was on the right side of that war. But we were the only nation with enough consciousness to say, this has got to stop. There are nations today where slavery is not only tolerated, it's, a, it's legal. It's the way things are. It's acceptable. And even if they don't label it as slavery, there are people in the same amount of bondage, some in worse, sex trafficking, sex slaves, the sex industry, all over the world. Many of those young people are being treated with more deplorable conditions than have ever been recorded anywhere else. That may be hard for you to swallow. It may be hard for you to believe. Do your research. Don't just buy into what you've heard. You may not know, historically speaking, there was a race of people who were enslaved because of their race for more than 400 years. Our country is not that old. There's no way Americans have enslaved anybody longer than the Jews and the Hebrew children were enslaved by Egypt and others. It can't be true. The math doesn't work. History doesn't get you there. Slavery didn't start in America. Slavery didn't end in America. It was a blight. It was a bad set of decisions. It was the way the world operated way back then. And it needed to come to an end. The battles that we face today, though, many of them are regurgitated irritation. arguments exacerbated you think i'm kidding just go watch fight videos on youtube for a couple of couple of minutes i've watched hours worth studying the, the social behavior of the crowd and i can tell you many many times there are two people who are having a disagreement that honestly anyone with a level head and five ounces of common sense it's about the weight of the brain five pounds could fix with a conversation and what looks like a fistfight or an altercation would simply be ended. A misunderstanding, an ill-spoken word, and I'm sorry would have fixed it. But instead, you have instigators who have no dog in this hunt. They got nothing to win or lose regardless of the outcome of this fight. But by golly, they want to see a fight. There were pretty peaceful rallies and protests in Dallas last weekend. Thousands, literally thousands of people turned out in the streets. And as much as I saw cameras getting up in the faces of people, bright lights shining in people's faces, for the most part I saw thousands of peaceful people with a legitimate complaint, a legitimate discussion. Their voices were heard, their faces were seen. They did what they came to do. But then I also saw six or eight with their faces covered, yelling into this large crowd, doing all they could to start chants of violence and anger. 
There's an old phrase that my grandparents have used, my parents have used, I'm sure yours have too, one bad apple spoils the bunch. You know what they mean by that? What they mean is that the rottenness that gets in that apple, literally the decay that is in that apple, if you leave it in the bushel basket or in the bag in the refrigerator with all the other apples, the decay in that apple will spread from one apple to the next apple to the next apple to the next apple. That decay becomes contagious. One handful, excuse me, one handful out of two to 3,000 people one agitator getting up in one other person's face can tip off an angry argument that will spread like the decay of an apple, like the virus in your computer, from one person, one app, one group to another until it's out of control. They tried in Dallas, and they failed. And I'm glad they did. Not because I don't want their voices to be heard, because that doesn't solve problems. They're no different than the guy standing on the outside of the circle when there's a fight going on, who rather than helping to find a peaceful resolution, is yelling, world star, world star, world star, beat him, break his neck, twist his arm off. Oh yeah, they're doing it. They're egging it on. They got no dog in this fight. They couldn't care less. They just want to see a fight. And I'm afraid to say, while there are legitimate concerns in racism, problems that need to be solved, apologies that need to be made, there are also a lot of people who are grandstanding on this notion because they benefit from a fight. They benefit from a war. It is funny though, that on the day of the total eclipse, the media had enough to keep them busy that there were no stories about race wars. Isn't that ironic? We really need a little more good news. We really need some people who will pay attention to the good things going on in this world to get involved in making our world a better place and not rousing up each other to anger. Listen, there is enough problem in this world without creating another one. There are enough starving children, enough people without water, enough places where there are no homes. We don't need to be creating issues and blowing them out of proportion. Don't hear that to say that I'm minimizing the issue of race. But do hear that to say that every answer doesn't have to be violence. Every answer doesn't have to be a rally and a war in the street. Your voices have been heard and common sense should prevail. Meanwhile, let's get busy helping someone else who is currently in a worse position. That's my two cents. I'm J. Lauren Norris and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.